Well, I'm excited to talk to you today about um, tailored by trust. Tailored by trust. Have you ever had a tailored dress or blouse or suit or jacket? Hmm? Yeah? Did, did mom ever make you some tailored mittens? I know Drup, that now I'm speaking Drup's language. Made out of seal skin? Hey Amen. Tailored hat with seal skin? No. Imagine this. Tailored is different than mass produced. Does that make sense? In the suit world, we call it bespoke versus rack. Bespoke means it's custom tailored with or based on your desire. Right? So what's a custom tailored shirt? Custom tailored shirt is you, you pick the material. You pick the thread. You pick the cut of the material. You pick the buttons type and color. You pick the cuffs. You, you pick the collar. You get to select each component of the piece. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. We were in Arizona a couple of years back. Our son was over there for training purposes, soccer. And one time he wanted to go into Phoenix, so we went into Phoenix. And his, his passion is to go and see high-level exotic cars, you know, sports cars. And so we did that. It was his day. And uh, Heckler and I always go, man, I can't wait until it's our day. You know, so we would go and we look at cars and watches. That's his two passions. We went to a Ferrari dealership and there they had also a Maserati franchise. And when we started speaking with the man, and this is an event with my son, we basically go there, introduce him to the salesman and we just go and have coffee and sit down. We're going to be there for several hours. And he will tell the guy everything about that car. And I always say, hey, man, who's selling who here? <laughs> and so, so they like him because of the, the knowledge and the depth of knowledge he has about their product. But my, eye caught, or my ears caught attention to whenever he said to my son, look at all of these samples on the wall. These are dash samples. There was every kind of wood you could imagine. Every type of metal or carbon fiber. Basically, if your brain could conceive it, it was on the wall. And he said, Caleb, you get to pick how your dash looks, the finish. Then he said, look at all these leathers, a book from hot pink to bright blues to yellows to oranges to the traditional colors. And he says, with this car, you get to pick the kind of color for your seats and we can mix and match. And Caleb, you even get to choose the color of the thread and none of it has to be conventional. See, Many of us come to know Jesus Christ and we think of Him in the light of a conventional relationship. A relationship that we have with one another. A relationship we had with maybe our parents or our cousins or our aunt, uncle, grandma and grandpa or our friends at school. We think in the context of conventional. But let me explain something to you. You can't receive all I believe that God has for you with conventional thought processes. My goodness, your Savior came out of the womb of a virgin. How conventional is that? I've never seen a virgin give birth yet. I might have Jesus in heaven go, show me that trick one more time. I want to see that. Right? So it's totally, his introduction into the earth was unconventional. Then here comes the Messiah. John the Baptist goes, behold the Lamb of God. He goes, Jesus, baptize me. That's like the biggest calling card. That's like getting a graduation certificate from all the Word of Faith colleges, all the Baptist colleges, all the Assembly of God colleges, all of the colleges at one time. I mean, that would be the best apex of approval. And Jesus said, no. What was he saying? John, your mind is thinking conventional, but I'm coming higher than convention. I'm coming bespoke. I'm coming tailor-made. I'm coming suited with all of heaven, which means I have to be baptized of you to fulfill my God, my heavenly Father's will. Unconventional thought. In the world today, conventional thinking is, if it feels good, I'm going to do it. If I want it, I'm going to have it. 
at anyone's cost. We think in the, in the United States of America that, you know what, I should have a right. My question is always, says who? Because if it's not a God-ascribed right, I don't want to take it. See, Adam and Eve took an, a non-God-ascribed right, and it threw all of us into a tailspin. Imagine what that can do for our family. Amen? Matter of fact, let me put it to you like this. The fruit can be present, but if God didn't say touch it, don't. Just because it's good for Sally don't mean it's good for Susie. Or Sue. <laughs> right? Think about that. See, just because something may be permissible doesn't mean it's acceptable. Right? So tailor-made is when we walk as spiritual beings, spirit-led beings, and we only touch that that God's ascribed to us, that that God says yes to, and we only propel our life in the direction where we feel leading of Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Be spoke. Turn to your neighbor and say, be spoke. Turn to him again and say, yeah, he spoke. He spoke, be spoke. Right? Amen. And, and so the unique thing about Taylor is when it doesn't fit right, automatically there's the mentality that it must be fixed. If you go to have a tailor-made suit or dress or shoes, I can't wait till the day I get tailor-made shoes because I've got some clumpers down here, man. <laughs> and it's hard for me to find shoes that fit just right. But imagine this. When... When you look or seek tailored something tailor made, in the in the uh, uh, I don't even know how to frame it in, in in the in the understanding of what you seek, they know they must make it fit. Does that make sense? I said this in pre morning in prayer this morning. Angels don't come into the earth doing whatever they want to do. Let me help you. Angels of God, angels from heaven, don't come into the earth, into this environment, and do whatever they want to do. They are on an assignment. They will only speak, and they will only conduct the will of the Father. Only. The ones that are chaotic, that do whatever, they, those are called demons. Those are the ones that were flung out of heaven with Lucifer. Does that make sense? Why? Darkness represents chaos means no order whatsoever. No mandate. Just absolute chaos. And that's darkness, right? What is that also? A lie. When a lie penetrates the heart of a believer, it brings chaos with it and deception. Amen? Are you getting this? So when we tar start to look at tailored, the title is tailored by trust. Your trusting is fabricating. Your trusting is building. Your trusting is fortifying. And what is it doing? It's framing your future. Do you hear me? It's framing your future. Um, Drop and I walk often in the park. And when we walk, we're always conversing about the dogs. Now, I don't want to confess this, but I have almost gone from a dog lover to almost a dog, not hater, not even abuser, no, a dog restrictor. Maybe not even dog, dog owner restrictor, okay? Because it's real clear in our park that there's a leash law and there's also a poo-poo law. Right? And they don't observe them. It's an amazing thing to me. All sizes of dogs run wild. And I'm not afraid of dogs. Now, my wife gets challenged by them, depending on size. And when, the, when I see them, I look right at the owner. The reason being is I believe if you want change, go right to the seat of authority. Put that in your notes. When you want change, go right to the seat of authority. Amen? 
Sometimes we as Christians in our nation are dealing with things because our forefathers didn't go to the heart of the authority and establish God's truth and stand at all costs. Bottom line. And so what do I do? I always show my presence to the animal and it freaks them out. It's like, and then I look the owner in the eye and I tell them, get a hold of your dog. And I mean, I say it with that kind of voice. They probably think I'm Hitler over there or something. So I, I'll tell them, get a hold of your dog. And I'll do this. And what I'm telling them is if that dog invades my space, I'm about ready to go ninja, kung fu, you know, what's that black and white bear? Panda, Panda on them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be the worst cat it met that day. <laughs> right? And at one time, I had an owner look me right in the eye and go, he'll only bite on command. And I said, I only hit on command also. Straight. Said that to the man. My wife's like, okay, Darren, it's okay. Come on. I'm like, no, he needs to understand that that dog, if it attacks you or me, all of a sudden went from friendly pet to lethal weapon. And I'll answer that with the same tenacity. Yeah. So the next loop we made around that guy, I just looked him right in the eye. Some of you are like, oh my God, my pastor, what's happening? Pray double, pray double this week. No, it's authority, right? It's violation. And because of violation, things go to another level, right? Does that make sense? Now, there's a man in that park we see every morning. He comes prepared. He has a water bottle for him and one for Jojo or whatever his dog's name is. And that dog is so well trained. He puts him out in the middle of the park. He, this dude's smart. This is a smart dog trainer. He has one of these things that flings a ball. You know, it, me, I'm sorry, I'm not this brilliant. I would throw the ball and go with the dog to get it. Okay, this guy stands in the center and throws it one way. The dog runs, gets it, brings it back. And while the dog's coming running this way, he's throwing it that way. And the dog is already, and it's just like, shoo, shoo, shoo. And in one command, boom, that dog's right there or down on its ground, on the ground. Instantly. Why? He's bespoke. He's tailor-made. His owner, his master, has taken enough time to care and develop and train him so that now he's a beast of honor and a beast of value. An animal of great value. And one day we got to see him. He put him on a leash and walked by us. And I stopped him. I said, sir, I want you to understand. I appreciate you taking control and training your dog. It's incredible to watch. And not everybody in this park thinks enough of their dog to train them and to keep them on a leash. He said, well, thank you. And we see him every morning. Like clockwork. See, sometimes... The beasts in our field are being beastly because we've not taken our place of authority and said enough is enough. Amen. We tried to just live the life of anything goes. I can go to Walmart and it's all going to fit. It's a discount. You know, there's five shirts in my size and they all fit kind of. Just good enough. Right. And we take that mentality as Americans many times. Well, it's just good enough. Well, this is okay. And we start to literally frame our world and create a thought process that, you know what? Good enough is just great enough for me. Instead of God's perspective is great. And I need to take my good opinion and transform it to a great opinion. Something of value. Amen? Now, where does this start? When you look in the mirror. Because how you see you is what will be cast as the reflection of how people see you. If good enough is just good enough, just people in your life will be good enough and not great enough. So when the opportunity comes, when it comes a hard press, when all of a sudden you got to have the breakthrough or you got to make the opportunity happen, those that you're connected with are just good enough people, not great enough people. Does this make sense? I don't know about you, but if I'm going to select a team, I'm going to find the great enough people, not just the good enough people. 
Those are the players we call on the bubble. Amen. That means they could go either way for them in a tryout. Do you hear me? Sometimes only in church do we just lower the standard of expectation or excellence or demand and good enough becomes our king instead of great as enough. Amen? Do you notice in the Old Testament, even the priests brought the best offering, the best lamb, the best sacrifice? Not just the good enough one. When they got into that mentality, Malachi is a rebuke first to the priesthood because they were offering up just good enough. You know, they put the ram up there that had three legs instead of four. One ear and half a horn. Right? They looked at the ugliest thing out in the field and went, he's going to be Sunday sacrifice. And they kept the very best for themselves. See, that's not God's way. That's the world's way. We want to be a people to give God all that he is rightfully his, all that's due him. We want to give him the greatest that we possibly have in life, lifestyle, in attribute, in personality, in who we are as people and what we reflect in the community. Now, hey, I'm like you. We fall short. But you know what? That doesn't mean we have to always be short. Right? That means we quickly adjust and move forward and demand more of ourselves. Isaiah 40, 31 says this, but they, and that word they there, is singling out a group of people. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. For years I hated this verse, friends, because I'm one of those like to move and move people forward, mobilize people, get them rallied up and get them moving. And I had so many people around me, well, just wait on the Lord. I'm thinking, if I keep waiting, I'll be 80. And I was in my early 20s at the time. Right? And it really bothered me. It annoyed me. I'd get around older people and they'd go, well, just wait on the Lord. And I'm thinking, you've been waiting so long, you're almost a statue. I don't want to be one of those. And I think both mentalities can be wrong. But between there, here's what I see today that I didn't see years back. This group of people are waiting upon the Lord. And look what it says. That wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So as they're standing, there's something going on. As they're standing, it may appear that they're statue-like or becoming a monument or their, their feet are growing roots into the ground, but something internally is changing. Something inside's moving. Something in their mind's looking forward beyond the present or the status quo. Amen? And because of that, look at what benefit comes. Their strength is being regenerated, renewed. Look at that. Their strength is being renewed. On occasion, when we go walking, Drop and I will run into a couple that are up, up in years. They should, you know, you'd see them, you'd think, well, they probably are, you know, starting to put their name in for residency at a retirement home just because of age. But when you see them walk, it's like, oh my God, there must be a fire somewhere because they got it locked up in high gear. Do you see why? They're renewing their strength. I refuse to be an old person in my years in the future. Not right now. But old person that is just naggy, haggy, and always regretting. Just old. Because you know what? When you're just old and you have nothing to live for, you stink old. You smell old. You smell like you came out of the box that's at the garage sale. Right? Matter of fact, what we should do for our family members that are in that frame of mind is buy them mothball earrings so they stay fresh. Amen. And I think a lot of times it's a choice. And maybe their parents didn't emulate to them or their grandparents how to live a life of joy even when you're in your mature years. I don't know about you. There's a day that I won't be able to put enough color on my gray. It's not yet. We're doing a good job. 
But eventually, it won't work. And when that day comes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to convince Strupp, gray is in. Do you hear me? Right? It's in. And, and, you know, think about that. One day, our chest goes into the drawers, the chest of drawer disease. I'm going to convince her, no, I have just built up my abdomen. Right? What am I saying? Learn to enjoy every phase of life. Learn to win at every phase of life. Learn while you're standing to have evasive action in your heart so you don't become concrete and just a simple statue. Maybe marbled for others to look at. You know what's interesting? Whenever you look at the marble and some of the sculptures of Michelangelo, they're beautiful, but they don't move. They are long time life lasting and they've lived out many lives. But they don't get to experience life. Does that make sense? So the ditch of the person that doesn't get the revelation of what I'm going to share with you today just becomes marbleized instead of rejuvenized in their standing. It goes on to say, they shall mount up on, with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So here we see there's mounting, there's running, and there's walking. But yet the first part of the verse says, those that wait. It's pretty hard to wait while you're active doing that. Walking, running, and mounting. So there's something more than just the waiting. That means I'm waiting, I'm enduring, I'm believing, I'm taking steps with my faith, even though it looks like I'm standing still to some. Amen? See, you can be like the palm tree that nothing's going on above ground, but inward your root system's going very deep. Amen? And then one day, like in the, I think it's the fifth year, it grows some 70 feet in one year. Just like bam. One time I had an oak tree. Oak tree, I found out, they have a different and peculiar root system. The root system on an oak tree sometimes is twice as tall as the tree above ground. And other trees, spread, uh, their root systems spread out. An oak tree has one main root that goes straight down. We had a swimming pool in one of our homes and the oak tree was right by it. And as it started to grow, I was concerned that it would break the wall of the pool. So I thought while it's still manageable, I should go and, and, and cut it down. And so um, uh, as we started doing I started digging down deep to the root. I wanted to cut it very low at the root. Before I knew it, I was in up to almost chest or shoulder deep. I thought I was going to end up in China. I was digging so deep. The root still went down, and it didn't get any smaller. And so I had to go and talk to somebody, and they said, well, now you're so deep, just cut it there, and there's some chemical you can... You can pour on it and it will kill the root. So I gave my oak tree a root canal. Amen. So you can be standing, but make sure if you're standing, there's something going on in your root system. You're getting rooted in the truth. You're getting rooted in your faith. You're getting rooted in the promise of God for your life. You're getting rooted in the possibilities of seeing God move on your behalf. Does that make sense? When waiting... Waiting is a process of time. Never forget that. While we're waiting, time is still ticking by. God doesn't hit a stopwatch up there when we're waiting. Things still keep moving. Does that make sense? So when we come out of waiting phase, we need to be able to quantum leap into the time that we spent waiting. Does that make sense? So if some of us are standing and waiting, and the others of us take off running to Disneyland down in Los Angeles, and then all of a sudden, two hours later, God says, go to the waiters. They have to do double and triple time to catch us. Would you agree? But only in God's kingdom, when you transition from waiting to go, all of a sudden you don't lose time. You are literally quantum leaped, teleported into your future where God wanted you. Does that make sense? 
You can be losing on the outside today, but inside God says, I'm tracking and I'm scoring and you're about ready to win big tomorrow. Does that make sense? I'm going to show you how this happened. So all of a sudden, a quantum leap kicks in. A quantum physic kicks in. And you're delivered into the promise God stated in the beginning. Does that make sense? Watch this. When waiting, strength is renewed because it states, run, walk. The word mount up means connected. Whenever you're standing by horses and the person that's leading us in the horse ride says mount up, they don't mean keep standing beside it. They mean jump on up. Means put your foot in the stirrup and throw your leg over. Get in your saddle. Saddle up. Mount up. That's why they call it a mount. Whenever you start riding horses, they'll ask, how's your mount? My mount's good. How about yours? Right? Meaning your saddles fit good. You feel good in the saddle. And you're right. You're set up properly. Amen? It's an amazing thing. Sometimes just in horse riding, you need to be a little more observant. Here's the Western way to ride. But all of a sudden when you go into dressage, English style, it's arched back, hands are down in front, double-handed rein, totally different, high in your mount. Because the balance is different for the objective. One time I rode a high-level cutting horse. That's like getting a horse that's on steroids and crack cocaine. And when it sees a cow, it's like the thing goes freaking berserk. I've ridden bulls, but nothing's like riding a cutting horse. And you would think, right, with a cutting horse, that, oh, my God, i got to hold on. You, you tighten your, your feet up to, to its belly. Oh, no, that means go faster. I'm like, what? So she's yelling at me. Carolyn's like, no, Darren, feet forward to make him stop. You put your feet forward and he stops, kind of like riding a Harley. I'm like, this is backwards to me. She goes, I know you ride like a bull rider. I know. <laughs> I can't ride a cutting horse. And this horse jumps like this the whole time. I'm like, good Lord, how do you do this? And the mount is just they stay centered. That's all they do. And how you work your feet determines what the horse does. I'm like, that's too complex for a bull rider. You know, just let me in a chute, slap him on the bum, and let me go wild with him for about eight seconds. Moving on. So sometimes we need to understand what is it that we're mounting to. The mount may be different this ride than it was the last ride. Sometimes we take the past and try to frame our future with the tactics of the past. And they don't work. This is why it's continual trusting God on this journey called life. Amen? How would you like to go against a great army and a, and a fortified wall? And God says, you got lanterns and some pots and pans. And they're like, great, God, what are we going to do? Are we going to cook them a barbecue and convince them to come out so we can run in? But at the wall of Jericho, what did they say? God said, at the time, I tell you, blow the shell fires and pound and break the lanterns. And that's what they did. And the wall came down unconventional, unorthodox process. Amen? Put this in your notes. Waiting tailors our ability to trust the Lord. Waiting tailors our ability to trust the Lord. I don't know why I always forget to hit that. I'm watching it up there. Put this in your notes. When we, think we, when we think waiting is wasting time, our core opinion is really this. We know more than God. At different times, we had to, to talk with our kids about this because they were goal setters, you know, had targets they needed to hit for their, their given endeavors. And I would always tell them, you know what? Be careful about goals. Goals are to propel you forward. It's to keep kind of a benchmark about where you're at. They're not there to be to your detriment. When you don't hit the goal, don't mentally spin out and wash out and become suicidal. Does that make sense? Just realign the goal, readjust your activity, and move forward. They're always there from the premise to motivate. 
and to mobilize, not to harm. So in goal setting, we always have to have that good balance, right? And so with us, many times, when we are waiting, we call that, we faith people, we're wasting time. Well, that can be a core belief that says, you know what, I, need, I know more than God. Sometimes you need to allow God to get things in order so you can walk in and take the plunder. Sometimes you need to let God work some things out so that, you know what, when you step into your tomorrow, you step into that promise, you step into that opportunity, it's custom tailored, it's bespoke. Look at Daniel. Daniel was petitioning God. Daniel was dealing with some principalities. Daniel wanted a quick fix fast, like Darren would have. But his angel appears and he says, sorry, it's been 20 one days, and I've been contending with the, what was it? The um, Persian, what did he call him? The prince of Persia. Imagine that. What would have happened if the angel didn't listen to God and listen to Daniel? Since we think we can command angels. What would that be like? The prince of Persia over that reason, which was a spirit stronghold, would have contended and kept that region which may have prevented God's will from coming to pass over that area and territory. Does that make sense? Check this out. God is putting things together on our behalf and preparing us for the opportunity. While God's preparing the atmosphere, while God's preparing the soil that you'll walk in or the harvest that you'll go and receive, He's also preparing you to receive it. You've got to have a barn if you're expecting to go and bring in a great harvest of hay. You've got to have a nice floor, a threshing floor, and a grinding mill if you're expecting to go and bring in the sheaves of wheat. If you're going to go and have great vats of wine, guess what? You have to have the wine press oiled up and ready. Does that make sense? Moving on. So there's never lost time. Preparatory work is essential work. Amen? Put this in your notes as a key. Waiting is solidifying us for the purpose of forward movement and momentum. Waiting is solidifying us for the purpose of forward mo movement and momentum. You can't take an army out trekking across the desert until you've got them outfitted with the proper gear and the right supply line. Anytime you move ahead of your supply line, you endanger the troops and their well-being. Those have to work together in unison so that you can fortify a, a strong front line against your enemy. Isaiah 40, 31 says the same, same verse, but from a different translation. It's called the Good News Translation. You know, if I ever wrote a Bible, I, I would like it to say good news. Right? Life-giving translation. Right? Fresh water. Right? Arrowhead. Lake Arrowhead water translation. Anyways, look at this. The Good News translation says this for Isaiah 40, 31. But those who trust in the Lord for help will find their strength renewed. Totally different. But those who trust in the Lord for help that's the key. We'll find their strength renewed. Sometimes God can't help because we're so busy helping ourselves help. Called self-help. Come on now. I'm all for personal development, helping and, and, and challenging ourselves, but also understand never take God out of the equation because he can do more in a minute than you and I can do in a millennium. Amen? Whew, man. God can step into your life, rebuke you to where your bones shake and you go, yes, God, I'll do it now. Right? He can. And we need to give him that latitude because everything's subject to change. Even our opinions. Amen? Even our opinions. Put this in your notes. Fear is not, fear is not a component of trusting the Lord. No. Reverential fear is the component for wisdom. 
Hello? Right? The beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. Is that true? Bible scholars. Okay. But it is not acquainted to or connected to trusting the Lord. Two different topics. So look at this. Fear is not a component of trusting the Lord. Faith is. And in faith, here's what's so key about it. It has wisdom. In faith, it has the ability to believe. In faith, it has the ability to submit to a higher authority, which is God. Amen? Let's look at the word trust. Here's your acronym. Total reliance upon sustainable truth. If you're asking me to trust in something, I'm going to ask you, is it a sustainable truth? Not a dream. Not, well, God said, because God says what He already said as sustainable truth. Or I'm of the opinion, hey, we're all of the opinion of something. I have to know, is it sustainable truth? Does that make sense? So when I'm building a bedrock or a foundation to set my life on, and to teach my family, and to school them in the ways of God, I have to know God said, not someone said. Amen? Have you ever heard this thought? Well, cleanliness is next to godliness. Show it to me in the Bible. If you can find that verse, I'm buying you a latte. It's not in there. Now, the, the understanding of, right, the hypotheses of is in there. Meaning when we're in God, we're clean and righteous. But whether you clean your house does not mean anything about whether you're saved. And I grew up hearing that, like you. There's many little sayings that we've had over the years. And we've got to quantify or we've got to verify if they're sustainable truths. Because if they're not, you can't build your life on it. And it has the potential of bringing in deception or rather than deception, chaos. And no one can withstand chaos. Amen? Not for a long term. So total reliance upon sustainable truth. That's trust. First is this question. What do we put our trust in or who do we put our trust in? Right? Now, if you go and buy a boat, Tim and I often talk about planes and boats. We, we both like each one of them. I'm hoping he gets the boat so I can go right in his boat, and he's hoping he can go right in my plane. So it's kind of a mutual benefit here. But when we're talking about boats, we have to talk about a sustainable vessel, meaning I'm not going to buy it today and it sinks tomorrow, right? <laughs> Come on now. No one would do that. Just like you wouldn't build a barn to house this year's harvest and not put the board so close that the rain can't come in or not put a roof on it. Does that make sense? If you build a barn that way, God help you. You might want to find a new business. <laughs> put this in your notes. Fear will always ex be excluded from the benefits of faith. Fear will always be excluded from the benefits of faith. Next. Put this in your notes. Um, the question is, where have we invested our trust? You can have trust that's pure and authentic, but invested in the wrong thing. Can you imagine at the turn of the century when horse and buggy was the trend that was leaving and automobiles was the trend coming? People that can try, continue to invest in the horse and buggy to try to make that sustainable transportation into the future of our nation, lost great deals of money. They had hope. They even had trust because most of them owned horses and wagons. And they knew it worked. The problem was it wasn't sustainable moving forward. Does that make sense? Look at this. Number four. Is that person or entity trustworthy? Better ask that question. Many times when we're dealing with people dating, we ask this question, are they trustworthy? Because if they're not trustworthy, don't try to get attached to them into a deeper level of relationship called marriage and you, and, and you don't trust them. Hold on. Time out. Pause. <laughs> Build trust, which is built on honesty and integrity so that you can commit long term. 
sustainable trust. With that, go with me to Ephesians. I want to show you something real quick about truth. We're in a day where people don't always want to hear truth. They want to hear what feels good. Right? I don't know about you. I put on a couple extra inches and I like drop to tell me how good they look on me. But you know my wife. That's probably not what she's telling me, right? Yeah. You know, I go in and I go, honey, you know, how do I look today? And the first thing she does, she grabs my cheeks, like the barometer of my weight, my fat to, to, to muscle ratio. She squeezes them and she goes, I think somebody's been eating too much. But she always ends it with this. I just love you. It's like, okay, at least I know that. And I just look at her and I just go, I'm creating more for you to love. <laughs> Trying to give you your money's worth, dear. Anyway, Ephesians 5.89. Look at this. Ephesians 5, 5, 8 and 9, not 5.89. 5, 8 and 9. <clears throat> for you were once darkness. If we would say this to people, they would look at us and almost rebuke us if they don't have a trust level with us. Does that make sense? The writer's saying, you were once darkness. And he's, this is in his letter to a group of people. And here's the key word, but now. I'm so thankful for the but nows in my life. I'm so thankful for the moments where God stepped in and said, but now, Darren, there's a new way for you. Yes, you blew it. You're dark. But you know what? You come into my glorious light and I'm going to robe you with my righteousness. And Darren, that but now means your sin is forgiven, your past is blotted out, and let's move forward. But now you are light in the Lord. Look at that. Walk as children of light. Verse 9 and as we walk as children of light, look at this benefit. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. For us to manifest the fruit of the Spirit, we have to have that component called truth. Verse 10, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. It may be acceptable to you and detestable to God. If it is, just get rid of it. I'll never forget, we had some good friends. They traveled the world over, spent a lot of time in Asia, and their house looked like a, it looked like a totem pole. You walked in there, there was all kinds of gods or goddesses from all over the world, carvings and idols. In their ignorance, they did not know what they had purchased. My wife and I looked in there. We about, we, we about had a casting out session. And as they began to gain knowledge, we didn't have to say much because God started to reveal to them what they had brought into their home. And they did the house cleaning. See, again, what can be acceptable to man can be detestable to God. And let's take the time to discover that. Psalms 28, 7. Look at what this says. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In Him my heart trusts. That's how important trust is. And notice it says, in my heart trusts. This is speaking of the deepest depth of your soul, your heart, your inner being. And that's where trust must be. It must be in the inner depths of your being so that no matter what blows on the outside, no matter what happens to this natural body, something deep on the inside says, but I still trust in the Lord. Amen. I think many times of people that are dealing, dealing with um, serious illness and disease that, that have faith in Christ to heal them. And when I talk with them, I always ask them, where is your trust? What have you placed your faith in? And I've had them before, literally near death's bed, say, Darren, I have put my trust in the Lord. Everybody wants to be a pastor, but nobody wants to show up on those days. 
when you hold them and you feel the life escape their body. And the last words they hear is you praying in their ear or in their face. Do you hear me? And I always say, when it's a believer and I'm there in those moments, God, celebrate and welcome them in. And my mind has to go to a place that says, all of heaven rejoices when one turns their life and gives it to Christ. These are real moments, friends, that when you trust, even when facing your last enemy called death, it says, my trust is in the Lord. He goes on to say, and I am helped, my heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to Him. My question is, what is the theme song of your heart? Is it thanksgiving? I'm like you. There's been things I hoped for and believed for and sown for and was disappointed when it didn't go the way I anticipated. Times that it hurt, great pain, cost a lot. And I'd go back and I would just cry like a baby and I'd just go, Lord, but my heart trusts in you only. Because it can't trust in things. It can't trust in people. It can't trust in job or occupation or money we've stored in our bank. It has to trust in God alone. Because all those things can fail. And all of them can disappoint. <laughs> Jesus revealed this to us. We are in a kingdom with no limits. Not based on conventional knowledge. He said to Nicodemus, Unless a man be born again, born of water and his spirit, he will not see the kingdom of God. He will not see heaven. That went against the conventional thought process of Nicodemus. Because Nicodemus thought, if I'm good enough, if I attend the ceremonies enough and the feasts, if I ascribe to the law enough, I shall be saved. And now he met God himself and God saying, all of that is good, but there has to be a rebirth. Does that make sense? Look at this. It requires to be born again. The experience of rebirth. Imagine that. Look at Lazarus. Jesus loved Lazarus. By the way, it's only not even 1130 yet. If I finish right now, they're, they're going to know we're Baptists. Okay, look at this. Is this good so far? Okay. If you need to stand up, because I know it's been a lot I put on you, just stand up and shake it and bake it if you need to. No? Are we good? Look at this. Jesus, uh, Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. When they met, Lazarus was, was a, a man of conventional thought process. He was a tax collector. And his job was to go out, and if you owed the nation money, he took property from you. So he was not always liked in the community. Matter of fact, it would be kind of like this, is if somebody next door moved in and you found out they were an auditor for the IRS. You might go, oh my goodness. Might want to take him some cookies. Some chocolate cake. Right? But think about that. Now, the good news is you have nothing to worry about unless you're cheating on your taxes. Right? But Jesus was a friend of a tax collector. And conventional school of thought is here's the Messiah. We know he's a king. And some wanted him to set up his new kingdom right now. How can he have relationship with that that's so detestable? Those that we reject in the community by occupation. So Jesus is around all the religious people, right? They're singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, right? And he looks out over the crowd as he walks by and he sees a man that's not exactly Peter's size, 
Okay? He's a, he's a man short in stature. And watch. Zacchaeus, to see this master, climbs up into a tree. Right? To see and get a different viewpoint. And Jesus recognizes this. And because of, I think, the effort. And, and he could see that, you know what? He was an outcast. He wasn't so well liked. Some way, somehow, Jesus was drawn to Lazarus. And he says, boy, get down out of that tree. I'm coming to your house for tea. And the Queen of England went, oh, great. He loves tea. No, I'm teasing. Anyway. So Lazarus, you know, has a relationship that births with Jesus. Zacchaeus. 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 All right. Like Zach with cactus. Zacchaeus. So Zacchaeus um, starts this relationship, right? With Jesus. Now, watch this. Go with me to John. Now let's talk about Lazarus. Okay? <laughs> Unconventional. Now, Lazarus was a friend of Jesus as well. I like Jesus because his friends were very diverse, unconventional. But notice he had friends that had influence in different areas of the community. So strategic. What would happen if you stopped cursing the drug dealer and became a friend to him? Not in his distribution, but in, gotta clarify, gotta clarify. <laughs> trust me when I say this, not in his distribution, but in his information. Does that make sense? I have to clarify some of the, anyways, look at John eleven eleven. I'll dig myself out of this one. These things were said to him. And after that, he said, speaking of Lazarus dying, okay? A group came to him and said, Lazarus has died. Your friend has died. Look at this. And Jesus responds, our friend Lazarus sleeps. But I go that I may awaken him out of a sleep. I'm showing you another element of unconventional thought. The thought of the multitude or the group coming to him because they were all friends. Kind of like all of us. Right. And if I fell over and and you guys found me dead, Jesus would say, oh, no, he's still alive. He's sleeping. Listen, he's snoring. Right. And um, so he says this. Jesus says, no, he's asleep. He refused to speak what the carnal man was saying to him. Sometimes you have to do the same thing. That's my whole point. If we're trusting in a tailor-made life from God, sometimes we have to speak unconventionally to our neighbors, our friends, and our peer group. Because they are speaking conventional. They're speaking conventional knowledge or understanding. And Jesus speaks right back into their face. No, he's asleep and I'll go and I'll wake him up. Now this is God. He obviously knew that Lazarus was dead. But he refused to speak what carnal knowledge could tell him. Does that make sense? Now, let me give this to you as an insight. Off note, off topic. You will be presented with things that are so conventional, your mind will say, it is black and something in your heart will say, don't speak it as black. I'm going to speak it's red or purple. Do you hear me? Especially when it comes to sickness in your body, illness in your body, right? Things that hit your, your pocketbook. I mean, you know, when all of a sudden people are losing, losing their jobs and you could be the next one on the chopping block, you have to speak something unconventional and declare it out. Amen. Look at this. Conventional thought is he stinketh. Jesus's perspective is he sleepeth. Pretty, pretty morbid, I know. But now Jesus is in front of the tomb of Lazarus. 
the body's been wrapped, mummified. And the whole entourage is there going, look, we told you. You call yourself God and look, he's buried, man. I can smell him from here. Right? Matter of fact, he's so bloated down there. Uh, you know, I'm glad we supersized his, cl his cloth that we wrapped him in. The body would blow. I mean, they would mummify them. And whenever he says, Lazarus, come forth, he spoke something unconventional. What was he saying? Wake up. Because death is no longer going to bind you. Simple. Because in God's world, things are simple. Truth is truth. It means what it says. And when he speaks it, he doesn't have private interpretation. And the body of Lazarus had no choice. When God says, come, it has to come. Some scholars say that the way the tombs were designed, it literally, the, the, the corpse had to lift up and literally fly out and through the chamber, zig, zig, what do they call it, seesawing, zig, zigzagging, and shoot out the tomb entrance. The next thing is, he's standing there wrapped up alive. Jesus, like every man, goes, Lazarus, what's up? He's like, mm mm. -mm. So his nickname became Mumbles because that's about all he could do. Think about that. Unconventional way of thinking. The conventional mind that day had to realize we are in the presence of God, heaven and earth, creator. Let me give you another one. This one used to freak me out all the time. Ecclesiastes 11.1, 1, cast your bread on the waters. Notice it's plural. It didn't say water. It says waters. Watch this. And you shall find it after many days. Well, I don't know about you, but as a boy, I tried that test. Have you ever tried to gather up your bread after it's been put on the waters? And the only bread we had back then was this organic bread called rainbow. Yeah. Non-HMO, <laughs> or H, what is it, GMO? <laughs> Non-HMO, non, no, I mean, this stuff, this stuff, this stuff will live beyond Lazarus, okay? <laughs> I mean, for all you people that are hoarders, what do they call those? The survivalists that are packaging up food, what do they call those? Uh, survivalists, they have a name for them, huh? Preppers, get rainbow bread. It and outlast a freaking nuclear disaster, okay? Anyways, so watch this. After many days, the Bible says, can, uh, according to Scripture, is the bread will come back to you. But all of us, by conventional thought, know if I take a loaf of bread, put it in water, a 50-gallon drum of water, I'll come back, and it will literally dissolve the bread to literally a small pieces, not even crumbs beyond the level of crumb, and it will dissolve in the water. Right? But that's contrary to God's Word. Let me show you something of a spiritual dynamic. What you and I take of matter and put into the waters, if you will, of the kingdom of heaven has the ability to separate, dissipate, and go and do what it does across the kingdom of God. But in your need, it comes back collectively, boom, as your loaf of bread. Bam. So as we give today tithes, we give offerings. It, we give when it hurts. We give when it's painful. We give when there's really not to give. You understand that, many of you. And sometimes it's like we're separating the pennies. They call them pence, I think. You're separating them. But watch, like bread, it will come back after many days. A loaf. That's powerful. Amen? Put this in your notes. God's kingdom is built on trusting in sustainable truth with concrete faith. God's kingdom is built on trusting in sustainable truth with concrete faith. I think of the time... When, no, uh, when Moses 
was told of God to go to the rock and speak to it, and it would give water. I'm, conventional wisdom says there is no rock that has water in it. Right? But he, in his haste, gets upset and strikes the rock. Think about that. See, God had to continue to produce because he said there's water in the rock. I, I, he could have kicked it probably and ro- water come out. Because God was shouldering the promise. Sometimes we get caught up in our method instead of just trusting God. He said it's there, it's there. Right? So Moses in his haste strikes the rock and water comes forth. Now, that act of disobedience under that covenant cost him a lot. No question about it. But the key component is God assigned water to be in that rock. Therefore, water was in the rock. I had a, 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 a minister friend um, in Guatemala that dug a well. You've heard me tell the story about this. And um, he dug the well where God said so. He walked the property and God said, there's water right here in this, this spot. It was a big piece of property that they made into a mission space where missionaries would come in and go out, had dorms there. I mean, it was a very nice property. But in this one location, God said, there's water there. Well, he drilled and he hit granite. And he drilled some more and he hit more granite. And it didn't matter how deep they would drill, they constantly hit granite rock and no water. Finally, they brought the specialist in and the specialist said, sorry, there's no water here. There is no water here. You're wasting your money. And he was wasting it by the thousands. He would go out and talk to his constituents and his partners and say, I know what God told me. God said there's water here. And they started saying, yeah, we've heard this the last time you needed to raise money for that well. But nevertheless, they were faithful and they just kept, they would just give to it. But watch this. There was a day when he said, I went to God. I started asking questions and God told me, go back where I told you to dig and do what I told you to do, dig. And it was on that time he finally bored through that shelf of granite, which was huge. And he hit the purest water in the entire region and his well never went dry. When things would get, you know, drying up around him, Dr. Zirkel's well was gushing, baby. They always had water. Do you hear me? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that how our God is? There was another man God said dig a well to. This guy looked like Elvis. And it would hard, it's hard for me to believe an Elvis looking guy. Okay? Elvis did not come back as a preacher. Wish he did. Amen. That would be great. You need to get saved. Yeah. Anyways, he didn't. And so he dug this well. And this well, God said, is healing water properties in it. There's, this water will heal people. And by the hundreds, if not thousands, have been healed out of this well. My water, my water, my wife got healed when she was obedient to what God said, and she drank a vial of the water. It healed her. The point I'm trying to make is when you trust in the Lord and the power of His might, it goes beyond you and I's might. I looked at this preacher. He looked like Elvis that had been hit by a truck. And I I had a hard time trusting and believing. So God had to take me out of the country so I didn't mess up the miracle. After preaching one night, I got the phone call. She called me. She says, you don't believe it. I didn't want to tell you because I know what you would have said. But God told me, Darren. And I did what God said. And all my symptoms are gone. Do you hear me? It doesn't matter if he heals us with a lamb skin, anointing oil, a prayer cloth, a shadow of the apostle. The key is my heart trusts in the Lord. And therefore, I will have what my God says is assigned to me. Now, if you've noticed, my, my wife has not made a doctrine out of water and selling water in the church here for healing. Right? Moving on. Put this in your notes. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart 
and lean not to your own understanding. Verse 6, in all your ways, circle that. Acknowledge Him. That word acknowledge, sometimes we fail to really emphasize or look at. It means be thankful. See His working in the middle of it. Acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Let me give you one more example in verse and we'll call it good. Think about this, car keys. Everybody has a set of them. Except him, he's believing for a set of them. Amen? <laughs> car keys. He's <laughs> like, yes, amen, pastor. Shit, da, 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 da. Amen, I'm in agreement with that. Right? <laughs> What's this? Car keys. Get this concept. It connects you to the mechanics of transportation. Now, do you notice when you go out there and you hit the button on your key, the horse down the street doesn't go, <laughs> have you noticed that? I figured that one out the other day. You know, I, I don't claim to be too smart, but I figured that one out. You know, it's an amazing thing. But what happens is you hear, doo, 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 right? And that's new technology. Because that wasn't when I started out. You didn't have an alarm like that, my first car. You know, I prayed that the thing started. Then I prayed that it would turn off, you know. So true story, you know. So, so think about this. The key connects you to the mecha mechanics of the transportation, right? For that to happen, the key must be put in the right place. Now, just to help us humans out, your key can be anywhere close to the car. You just have to hit the button that says, push to start. <laughs> We've become so intelligent, they have to actually put that on the button. Push to start. <laughs> right? You're going out there. Can you imagine a very astute attorney goes out there, spends a hundred and something thousand dollars on a really nice car, gets in there, and he has to see a button that says, push to start. Because he's so brilliant. Right? Imagine that. But I'll tell on myself, one time I rented a car, I got in it, I had the key, I couldn't find where to put the key, and I'm sitting there wondering, what in the world do I do? There was no push to start, there was a gear shift up here. I got out of the car, went back to I said, I hate to say, that I don't know how to start this car. It was the first time I'd ever been in one of these hybrids, right? And she goes, uh, Mr. Goodman, that car, you just have to put your foot on the brake. I don't want to break. I want to start it. She goes, I know, but that's how it starts. I'm like, oh, my God. So I got in that George Jetson looking car, put my and it started. I'm like, this is crazy to me. So my question is, if I hit the brake hard, does it turn off? Anyways, I have a car that says push the start now. Because I'm so brilliant, right? Moving on. So the key has to be put in the right place, right? Check this out. I need not be a mechanical engineer or an expert. It's become dummy proof. Think about that. This is the power of the key. Now imagine whoever has the key in their hand has the rights of access and usage over that car. Right? I saw last night on late night TV where thieves basically just walk up to the car and convince the person to give them the key. And they do, because that's better than getting shot. True story. They're stealing cars. California is one of the top places. Santa Maria, as a matter of fact, one of the highest places of auto theft. And anymore, they just walk up and say, get out of the car and give me the key. It's real simple. And if that happens, you just hand them the key. You can replace the car, amen? Yeah. Then you say to them, could you put gas in it before you bring it back, please? Thank you. <laughs> Anyways, so watch this. Just because you have the key and just because you have usage doesn't mean you have to be a mechanical engineer. It doesn't. Or an expert. Matter of fact, watch this. All the years of development, research, expert opinion, prototypes... And millions upon millions of dollars of R&D, research and development, are now your benefit. 
they're now benefiting you. All because you have the key. So my question is this. Do we really have to understand all of heaven? Do we have to know all the different you know, festivals of the Old Testament? Do we have to know all the feasts? Do we have to know the ten keys to faith in every given situation? Or do we just need to have the key, Christ, Him crucified, the door and access to God? Amen? We can start right there. And I would believe that if our heart is totally trusting in Him, God in His brilliance will take care of all the mechanics and all the expertise on the other side. Amen. Sometimes we don't need to figure everything out. We just need to believe and enjoy the journey. Amen. Romans 8, 28. This is the last one right here. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And may I add this. That's just not church callings, and church purposes. Let me say it one more time. That's just not church callings and church purposes. It's life. It's all of life. It's in the living and serving the Lord while we're here on the earth. It encompasses everything. The time we are in church, the time we are involved in church activity, but also it does not supersede the time we're on the job or serving people in our community through our talents and our skill sets. All of that is life, and Jesus redeemed all of it for our benefit. Amen? Close your Bibles. Amen.